Hello. In this film, I'm going to talk about the development of Sinclair Radionics' range of mini or pocket televisions. More information about this can be found on my website, Polymath Perspective. Look out for interviews with electronics designer Brian Flint, product designer Rick Dickinson, and tube designer David Southward. As you may know, Clive Sinclair is a British electronics design engineer and entrepreneur. In the 1960s and 70s, he was based at Enderby Mill in St Ives in Cambridgeshire, and then in the 1980s, he was in Cambridge itself. He famously created the Sinclair C5 electric vehicle, which was a notorious flop. Now, given the amount of electric vehicles and mobility scooters around at the moment, maybe he wasn't too far off the mark. And that is really the story of a lot of his creations. He also built hi-fi systems, created one of the first digital watches, a digital calculator, and arguably the first affordable home computer in the ZX80. That was followed by the ZX81, and then the hugely successful ZX Spectrum. The televisions weren't a commercial success, but Sinclair was working on them for about 20 years, so it was a project that was very close to his heart. The first in the range was the MTV-1, pocket television. Now this was shown as far back as 1966 at a trade show. At the time it was called the Microvision. But it was a long way from production. By the time Brian Flint joined the company in 1971, the process of of building the TV was awaiting three ICs to be delivered. These were being manufactured by a company called Texas Instruments. The purpose of these ICs, integrated circuits, was to package a lot of the circuitry into a small space. So a lot of the discrete components, resistors, would be put into one of these ICs. And that would save time in manufacturing and costs and also space in the box. Bear in mind they're trying to make these TVs as small as possible. While the company was waiting for the ICs to arrive, they were also trying to manufacture their own tube, a cathode ray tube, which is known as a CRT. And this was being manufactured for them by a small company in South London. And it was particularly notable for its shape. It was shaped a bit like a coffin, Whereas that's perhaps a more standard size and shape. And indeed, this is one that was used in a later version. We'll get onto that later. The problem with this tube was it didn't work properly. So that we can discuss why the tubes didn't work, I'm going to explain a little bit about the innards of a tube. So, what you have is a cathode. Hence the name, a cathode ray tube. And the cathode is a wire here. It's coated in a compound which emits electrons when heated. So we have our wire and it is heated up to a very high temperature in a very specific spot. And that then starts to give off electrons. All well and good. But those electrons need to be focused. So firstly, they pass through something called a control grid. Then after the control grid, they're put through a three-stage component. Here we've got a accelerator, a pre-accelerator. Then it goes into this middle section here, which is a focusing ring. And then we've got this section here, which is another accelerator, which by that time the beam is very focused and that makes it shoot along at a great speed. Now that beam goes to the front of the tube and strikes the glass at the front which is coated in phosphor which when it's hit with electrons it lights up giving you your image. But the image needs to be drawn so this beam has to be controlled. So inside the tube you have some plates you have X and Y plates. And here 
we have one set of plates and these will pull the beam left and right like that so it allows it to draw across then you have another set here now these pull the beam up and down so with these four plates you can control the action of this beam and as it whizzes along it draws a picture and you might have heard that televisions have lines and the more lines it's got the more detailed the picture roughly speaking so this is whizzing along drawing the lines drawing the picture recreating it over and over again very quickly the problem in the coffin shaped tube was this whole assembly wasn't fixed very well and the slightest bit of g-force applied to the tube if it got shook or moved these would move a tiny bit and then that would completely mess up your image another problem was they hadn't really got rid of all the air inside there were tiny molecules of air and when you get air in a tube that has a high voltage on it all sorts of problems happen so I'm going to quote from the Brian Flint article as he explains that particular problem we had problems with the vacuum inside if you get a few parts per million of air inside a tube when you put a high voltage on it I'm talking about one or two kilovolts the air becomes very conductive like a piece of copper and causes the thing to short out all the ions shoot down the tube it flashes over and blows up all the semiconductors so there are lots of problems with this tube eventually the coffin shaped tube idea was buried and Sinclair Radionics decided to approach manufacturers who were already making tubes successfully who had big production plants and knew what they were doing they contacted Thorne in North London and they contacted AEG Telefunken in Germany in the end they found that Telefunken were most able to adapt to the requirements of this particular design in particular the Telefunken tube used a lot less power it used about 50 milliwatts to heat the wire whereas the Thorn one used about 500 a huge amount more which was over half the consumption of the whole set which was prohibitive eventually the chipset arrived from Texas Instruments and these ICs were put onto a circuit board and tested to see how they performed unfortunately they weren't really working as well as the company had hoped they would they weren't really going to do what they should be doing so the company recruited a guy called Adrian Espin from Texas Instruments themselves and his job was basically just to get these chips working one way or another but by about 1973 the company concluded that it just wasn't going to work they weren't going to be able to work with these chips so they decided that they had to design some new ones Adrian designed two ICs and Brian Flint another and these were manufactured in huge numbers for the televisions you probably can't see very well but under here is one of the ICs and this is a prototype for an oscilloscope that was produced by Sinclair in the end and it actually uses the same CRT that was used in the televisions and here you can see the mu metal it's called right round there and that's basically to protect the tube from the Earth's magnetic field to stop it deflecting the beam of electrons ultimately the MTV1 as it was called came out in about 1977-78 and it was multi-standard that meant that it had tuners in it that would operate in various countries across the world where they have different standards unfortunately it didn't sell very well this was really because it was very expensive so a cut down model was produced fairly quickly afterwards and here we have a prototype of it here this is called a microvision plus but I think the street name was an MTV or TV1B 
And as you can see, it was given a molded plastic case and that cut down the cost quite a bit. It also had just the one tuner in it. So this tuner makes it compatible with UK systems. I think there was an MTVC and an MTVD for different territories. Now this prototype has a little radio built in and that was one of the ideas that they were considering at the time. So it just sits on the desk like that with an aerial and you'd watch it. As you can see this design is quite compact very small really but it still didn't sell particularly well and Sinclair decided that it really needed to be redesigned and he decided that the problem was that it needed a flat tube. Now as you can see tubes tend to be long, longish and that is because you need this whole assembly to fire your electron beam down to the screen. For a flat screen design the idea was to bend the cathode ray electron beam at a right angle so it would come along and then bend then hit the screen. Now the problem with the flat screen idea was that there weren't any flat screen tubes. They had to be developed. Now Sinclair could have gone to Telefunken again and said now look can you use your expertise to develop this tube? But instead he decided to pursue this himself. So a workshop was set up at the Enderby Mill site in a shed and some engineers who had expertise in tube design were recruited. Now at this point the British tube industry had disappeared really and so there were a lot of clever people who knew a lot about tubes who were looking for work. A couple of those were recruited and also David Southward of Cambridge Instruments was recruited and his job was to further the whole process to come up with the the tools needed to build these tubes. What Sinclair told David Southward was that he wanted to be able to make a million of these tubes a year. So a whole method of manufacturing them had to be designed. And this was all taking place in this shed where they were doing all these experiments. Testing out the glass, testing out the assembly, trying to get a method of getting all of these components to work and at a low power. Here's a quote from the interview with David. He said, we needed equipment to, for example, vacuum form soda glass, which is ordinary window glass, into the right shape. When I joined, we had nothing that looked as though it could be made at all. The problem was, if you mould different kinds of glass, the thermal expansion of the materials don't match, and so they are difficult to seal together without them cracking. They had made a pressed glass enclosure when I arrived, but hadn't managed to seal it properly. That's when I said, look, let's try forming soda glass. For that, we were just taking an ordinary sheet of glass, heating it up to the appropriate temperature, and then applying a vacuum to draw it down onto the mold that we had made. According to David Southward, one of the problems is that every factor of 10 increase in terms of output means that you've got to come up with a new method of manufacture. The tubes also had to be low power because they were running off a battery. So one of the ways that they kept the power low was using this very, very thin tungsten wire. It was just over half a thou in diameter. And it was a relatively long bit of wire for a small tube. And it was coated in this substance that would emit and stripped and joined fixed at one end I think and on the other end it was on some sort of little spring and it had to be positioned really really precisely the tolerances for this were incredibly low and all this had to be done in the production line in about a minute so in this shed they had to come up with a method of manufacture so all of this could be done quickly and accurately it wasn't until Sinclair's success with the home computers ZX80, 81 and ZX Spectrum which was phenomenally successful 
that the funds became available for David to really be able to take what they were doing in the shed and progress it on, bring in the equipment and the resources to take these ideas and get them to the stage where it could be manufactured. In terms of the electronics, the electron beam that was bent at a right angle ended up creating a trapezoid shape. This was because at one end of the screen it was being bent further than the other side. So some additional electronics had to be designed where waveforms were input into the circuitry to compensate for this trapezoid shape. And initially they were using the circuitry that they had for the TV1B and then basically building onto that to get a working prototype. Now sometime in about 1978 there was a working prototype and this was created using a tube I think that was manufactured in a shed, not a production tube but one that actually worked. Uh, this modified circuit from the TV1B and also a box possibly made out of balsa wood that was made by Rick Dickinson which pretty much looked like a finished thing when it's put together and this prototype worked and this was shown sometime towards the end of the 70s however this was still a very very long way from being something that could be put into production the other design feature I should mention about the flat screen TV is that it used a times 2 magnification lens in front of the CRT cathode ray tube so here's the prototype of the oscilloscope with the normal CRT so there's your screen and the lens set in front of that and what that meant was that they didn't actually have to make the tube as big as they would otherwise and therefore it used less power and also it meant that the beam wasn't deflected quite as much as it would otherwise be. So this trapezoid shape that they had to compensate for wasn't so great. So there was less compensation, less added circuitry, less problems basically. Even though Sinclair had his prototype for the flat screen TV ready in the late 70s using a tube that David and his colleagues had put together in the shed the electronics were from the TV1B modified and the box was something that Rick Dickinson had mocked up to look pretty much like the real thing. It wasn't until 1983, some five years later, that the actual finished manufactured product was ready to buy in the shops. Now, in that time, the competition around the world, other companies, they had really got wind of what was going on and they were bringing out their own versions. And so, Sony had launched their Watchman flat screen TV. Casio soon introduced the first portable LCD television. That was called the TV10. And Epson followed with the ET10, which was a portable colour set. Really, it was too late. But as you can see from my phone, 40 years on, a device on which you can watch TV and films it's not so very different. It's pretty much the same size. It's a little thinner, perhaps, but Sinclair wasn't so far wrong. Really, it was just a matter of him using the wrong technology and maybe being a little bit ahead of his time. <laughs>